This video is brought to you by Morning Brew. What's up guys, Michael here. Nine years after the previous film, and over 20 years since the show first aired, the story of Neon Genesis Evangelion seems to have finally come to an end. For real this time. Thrice Upon a Time rounds out the rebuild of the Evangelion saga and apparently brings Shinji's long story to a close. After taking part in countless giant robot battles, merging with the spiritual essence of his mother, and watching the whole of humanity get reduced to primordial soup only to be spat back up again, it's safe to say that this kid's been put through the ringer. But what did it all mean? No matter which version of Neon Genesis Evangelion you're most familiar with, you'll find that it's less about giant robots or apocalyptic angels and more about the struggles of a lonely, damaged teenage boy. So to understand the show, we have to understand Shinji. And to understand Shinji, we have to learn about one of history's most revered sad boys, Soren Kierkegaard. We'll explain why in this Wisecrack edition on Neon Genesis Evangelion and the spoilers ahead for the whole Evangelion canon. But before we get into it, I wanted to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Morning Brew. Now, I don't know what you do as soon as you wake up in the morning, but I don't waste much time before I'm on my phone, furiously scrolling across multiple apps, trying to catch up with what's going on in the world. And as soon as I'm out of bed, it's a matter of minutes before I've opened up 10 new browser tabs with articles I'm likely never going to actually read. It's not the most efficient way to get caught up with what's happening in the world. And that's why Morning Brew is such a game changer. It's a free daily newsletter delivered right to your inbox Monday through Sunday. It gets you up to speed on everything going on in business, finance, and tech in about five minutes. And unlike traditional news sources, which, let's be honest, can sometimes feel a bit dry and boring, Morning Brew's articles are written in a relevant, witty, and informative way. Whether you're trying to keep up with the ever-changing world of cryptocurrencies, tracking the continued economic impacts of COVID-19, or even learning about what's going on in the world of sports memorabilia, Morning Brew has got you covered. If you're interested in business, finance, or tech, there is no good reason not to subscribe to Morning Brew today. It's absolutely free and takes about 15 seconds to subscribe, so click the link in the description to subscribe to Morning Brew today. Now, back to the show. And now, a quick recap. Both the original Evangelion and the subsequent rebuild follow a pretty similar plotline. Young Shinji is recruited by a shadowy organization run by his father to pilot an Eva, i.e. an enormous robot, in order to fend off the angels, i.e. some apocalypse-inducing monsters threatening what remains of the world. Shinji and his fellow Eva pilots, Asuka and Rei, work together to protect their world from these monsters. Their confrontations with the angels escalate, and that's where the rebuild diverges. That and swapping out the greatest theme song ever with whatever this is. See, mid-fight, Shinji accidentally causes an almost apocalypse, and then almost does it again, though this time his friends stop him. The latest film, Thrice Upon a Time, opens with a catatonic Shinji whom nobody really wants to deal with. Shinji's friends try to stop his dad from fulfilling his evil plan, which we'll get to later, but they all lose. So Shinji rallies, takes on his dad, and after a major therapy session, proves victorious. Now, throughout the Evangelion show and its various cinematic iterations, Shinji is going through it. Particularly in the fourth film of the rebuild, where he's almost comatose with despair. And much like me in seventh grade, he doesn't really want to exist anymore. Seriously, f seventh grade, it's, it's the worst. And here's where the influence of Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard crops up. Fun fact, one of the show's original episodes is even named after his text, The Sickness Unto Death. Now, it may be a story involving skyscraper-sized sniper rifles and penguins named Pen Pen, but the Evangelion Extended Universe really gets right to the heart of some of Kierkegaard's greatest concerns. Primarily, it investigates his idea that the main source of our existential angst is the fact that we are inherently fractured individuals. That is to say, we're always caught between who we are and who we want to be, between the feeling of freedom and the force of necessity. We're ephemeral minds inside meat and bone bodies. That's really gross. And worst of all, we're finite limited beings with the capacity to contemplate the infinite. And all of this leaves us feeling miserable and hopeless. In short, we're kind of a mess. And this is certainly true for Shinji, an individual who is forced to continually connect and disconnect from a giant metal body that both is and isn't his own. And it doesn't get better when he's in the outside world. He lacks a real identity. 
and is constantly conflicted by the various whims of those around him. Throughout the story creator Hideaki Anno has spun, Shinji seems to prefer taking orders from others rather than making choices for himself. He's torn between two impulses, to shut up and do his job, or to simply run away from this sh existence. In response, he shrinks into himself, minimizing his existence as much as possible. With no solid grasp on who he is, he ends up wishing not to be at all. I don't even want to be around anymore. Throughout Evangelion, we see other characters dealing with this same sort of separation from self. Shinji's fellow pilot, Rei, is the most literal embodiment of this crisis. She's a clone within a series of clones, created from someone else's memory and to serve someone else's purpose. In response, she also tries to remove any sense of her own individuality, emotionlessly following the order she is given. Asuka, on the other hand, goes on the offensive, aggressive in all areas of her life. She tries to run from the damage of her own sense of disconnect by asserting herself onto the world as forcefully as possible. But in some ways, the most dangerous form of disconnect we see comes from Shinji's father, Gendo. Because even though he's a grown up, he is every bit as disjointed still unable to fully accept the loss of his wife. Rather than working to cope with his grief, he works with the very creepy organization Sela to execute an objectively bonkers plan, the Human Instrumentality Project, which will attempt to combine all human beings into a single entity. This would obliterate the entire concept of personhood. We'd thus avoid the pain of dealing with other people and nobody would ever feel lonely again. Cool plan, but uh, I'll stick with therapy. Anyway, here, Gendo is trying to avoid what Kierkegaard believed to be the greatest pain of human existence, dealing with having a self, which he characterized as a state of despair, aka the sickness unto death. And this state of despair doesn't just keep us from understanding ourselves, but also from relating to others, which for Kierkegaard makes organized society kind of a bummer. We see this reality manifest throughout both the original series and the rebuild. Shinji is plagued by intense social anxiety. Indeed, he'll often retreat from the world entirely rather than reach out for the care and compassion he so desperately desires. Similar to our guy Kierkegaard, who would spend days alone inside his Copenhagen apartment furiously writing and drinking way too much coffee. He even broke off an engagement with a woman he loved simply because he thought he wouldn't be able to live up to her expectations. Similarly, Rei numbs herself to the entire idea of emotional contact, while Asuka variously tries to take command of her relationships or eschews them entirely. Because they can't reconcile their own identities, trying to forge any kind of connection with others is a messy and potentially painful process. Two fractured individuals aren't the best match for a healthy friendship. Evangelion literalizes this conflict by invoking German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer's term, the hedgehog's dilemma. Schopenhauer described human relationships as being akin to a bunch of hedgehogs trying to huddle together for warmth. We desperately long for the comforts of intimacy, but when we get too close, we prick each other with our dumb quills. Fearing the pain of human connection, the characters all find different ways of closing themselves off from others, whether they're entering Eva's, hiding in their rooms, or listening to their Walkmans. And in the most recent installment, we find characters still grappling with these issues. Shinji is always unable to express himself or comfortably interact with others. Meanwhile, Rei has to be taught even the most basic of human interactions. And of course, Asuka remains as condescending and antagonistic as ever. Healthy relationships seem to be in short supply for our animated friends. So the big question that Evangelion, and especially the rebuild poses is, how do we overcome this crushing sense of isolation, both from ourselves and those around us? The answer, according to both Kierkegaard and 70s rock phenomenon Journey, is simple. Don't stop.
Indeed, Kierkegaard argued that the only way to combat the despair of being human is simply to have faith. That is, choose to fully believe in something that you can't necessarily prove through logic with any mathematical certainty. His top pick for thing to have faith in was God, but he also thought people could find meaning by having faith in more human type stuff too, like love or art. Faith, he said, was the only way to ever come to a meaningful understanding of the world or our own place within it. And more importantly, it's the only way out of the cycle of despair that we see so many of our characters caught in. To this end, Kierkegaard cautioned against relying on cold, hard logic, which while it can produce loads of useful practical information about math and physics and stuff, will never lead us to any greater existential truth about ourselves. That's because we're not logical propositions. We're weird animals that get excited about happy hour at our local Applebee's. And Evangelion is, in some ways, a dystopian testament to that idea. While humanity has used its empirical know-how to craft towering super weapons and do battle with huge kaiju, the only place any of it leads is towards annihilation. Science and technology has not made for a happy world. Rather, one filled with empty streets, lonely children, broken homes, and shattered infrastructure. In fact, the closest thing we get to a real community is the refugee town in Thrice Upon a Time, a place with far less technological prowess than any other setting in the series. The limitations of science is exemplified in the character of Gendo, who, rather than coping with the pain of losing his wife, attempts to science himself out of that pain. And this is one of Kierkegaard's main concerns, namely, that an emphasis on rationality, which was all the rage in 19th century European philosophy, ends up slowly destroying our own individual humanity. Trying to solve existential human problems, like grieving for a dead spouse with rational logic, is a bit like trying to fix the carburetor on your 72 Camaro with poems. And this is why for Kierkegaard, human despair can't be solved with reason, but rather with faith. Now, for most of the latest film, and indeed most of the series, Shinji is not what you would call a believer. He seems conflicted about the basics of morality and is in a state of constant doubt. And this pretty much remains his whole ass deal until the climax of the final battle in Thrice Upon a Time. With Asuka out of commission and Mari overwhelmed, Shinji finally does what Kierkegaard wants us all to do. He takes a leap of faith. Kierkegaard loves to talk about leaps and moments of decision because these aren't logical deliberations, they're acts of freedom in which one takes a risk. And these decisive actions help us break the cycle of despair because rather than keeping us at our desks, rationally reflecting on our lives, they force us to get our asses out of the door and actually live them. After spending most of the third and fourth movies in passive despair, Shinji finally decides to believe in himself, and more importantly, to believe in the people around him. See, for a long time, Shinji has ignored flashy neon signs that his friends give a shit about him and think he's capable. It is only when he actually believes what they're saying that he can live up to the monumental tasks before him. <laughs> And that's when he steps up and chooses to pilot Ava number one for a final time. This evokes philosopher Alain Badiou, who builds off Kierkegaard to argue for a type of collective subjectivity. That's the idea that when people rally together around a shared cause, they necessarily form deep bonds and can achieve things which previously seemed impossible. Think uh, the peasants who started the French Revolution, or the Mighty Ducks winning that hockey tournament. And like Kierkegaard, this happens when people have the faith to commit to an idea or cause. At its most extreme, Beju argues, we can become immortal as we relate to others through an idea or cause. In doing so, we can participate in something bigger than ourselves and our own measly lives. It's fitting that Shinji's come to Jesus moment disproves the hedgehog effect. Finding that being close to and caring for others actually makes your life less painful and more meaningful, though it does not, to be clear, mean you should go hug a hedgehog. Of course, this all leads up to the final confrontation between father and son. When they first collide, they're evenly matched in identical armor, wielding identical weapons, even making identical fight moves. It isn't until a newly socially intelligent Shinji breaks the cycle of combat and tries to connect with his father that they make any progress. Here, Shinji finally understands the motivations behind his dad's extremely ambitious and impractical plan. 
That is, the pain of losing his wife, Shinji's mom. The pain caused by this emotional fracture leads Gendo to try and annihilate something that's essentially human, his selfhood and that of every other human on Earth. Rather than taking a note from Kierkegaard and bravely accepting his internal fractures and trying to live a meaningful life, he's simply trying to kill that difference. It's both kind of rational and also completely f bad And ultimately, it's not the ambition of his project that stops Gendo. It's finally connecting with another human. Ironically, the man who was fighting to artificially connect all of humanity really just needed to go to therapy with his emo son. After connecting with Shinji and achieving closure, he can finally die and rejoin Shinji's mom in some weird ether world. And what about Shinji? He's confronted his internal demons and defeated slash freed his dad, so what more could a whiny teenage boy ask for? A girlfriend, obviously. After Mari appears to rescue him, we jump into a future where Shinji, for the first time ever, is an adult. Not only an adult, but one who can talk and even flirt with Mari, his apparent partner. Here, he's done what Kierkegaard never could, namely, finding happiness, and of course, a girlfriend. Once Shinji took the leap of faith and found a truth he could care about, he grew up and moved on to the next stage of his life. Which brings us to one last element of the story. You might have noticed there's an Eva pilot that we haven't mentioned yet. Kaoru. He plays many roles in the story, helping Shinji start to learn to be confident, introducing him to music, functioning as a homoerotic love interest, and accidentally almost bringing about the end of the world. This happens a lot. But for us, his most important moment in the new movies is this line. See, at the end of the rebuild, it is revealed that there have been many Kaorus, and it is heavily implied many Shinjis, Reis, and Asukas. It looks like everyone's been stuck in a good old-fashioned time loop. <laughs> However, at the end of Thrice Upon a Time, Shinji has clearly moved on to a whole new world of Mari, one free of Eva's. So what are we to make of this? Well, there's a lot of ways to look at it, but we think there's something meta going on here. Hideaki Anno has long talked about how the ending of Evangelion wasn't satisfying to him after the show and subsequent movies ran out of money. Not only that, but since the release of the original series, he's been largely known as the guy who did Evangelion. That's in part because it was a great artistic achievement, but also because it was a deeply personal piece of work through which Anno worked through his own feelings of depression and isolation, like a modern version of a certain sad Dane. With both Shinji and Gendo each breaking through the loop at the end of this film, we can interpret this as Anno finally putting the series to bed and being ready, just like them, to move on to something new. That's also why it's fitting that as Mari and Shinji run out of the train station, the movie concludes with some straight up live action shots of the very town where Anno grew up. Much like how Shinji finally escaped from the spirals of teenage depression, it seems that Anno can finally move on from the magnificent project that was Neon Genesis Evangelion. But what do you guys think? Is Shinji a Kierkegaardian hero? Is loving people just like hugging a hedgehog? Let us know what you think in the comments. Smash that like button like you're preventing a third, fourth, seventh, 59th, 16th, I don't know, however many impacts, we're not sure. And don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.